I'm a consultant in emergency medicine in Aberdeen. Uh, I'm also a reader in emergency medicine at Aberdeen University and a professor of remote medicine at the Robert Gordon University. My other roles include um, being clinical lead for the Scottish Centre for Telehealth and Telecare in the Digital Health Institute, and I'll come back to that later in the talk. So uh, I've been asked to talk about major trauma today. Um, this is a subject close to my heart. I remember on my first day in the emergency department in Aberdeen in February 1987, having to look after a gentleman who jumped off Union Bridge. Uh, I remember us immediately relocating his uh, fractured, dislocated ankles and resuscitating him, and that got me hooked from then on. So what I'm hoping to cover in this session is not the complexities of uh, major trauma in terms of direct management to the uh, patient, because most of you will get that this training in detail. But what I'm hoping to cover is really the core aspects of major trauma. And how I'm going to do that is I'm going to review the history of trauma in the UK over the last 30 years that I've been involved in it. Then I'm going to talk about how we measure major trauma, because as in everything in medicine, if you can't measure it, you can't change it. And there's been a lot of change over the last 30 years. So I'll just be explaining how we've managed to measure that and, and the changes in, uh, that have come about from that. Then we'll talk about what are the current interventions that we're using in major trauma. And then finally, we'll have a chat about the systems because now in Scotland, there are going to be four major trauma centres uh, and a trauma network that's already been established in England. And that's going to cover um, the whole of Scotland. What I won't be covering is I'm not going to cover paediatric trauma because that's a subspecialty uh, topic. It needs a session completely on its own. And in fact, the core um, measures that you take are exactly the same in children, just adapted uh, separately. So we'll be focusing on adult trauma uh, in Scotland. So regarding major trauma, I think everybody knows the um, story about how advanced trauma life support came about. It was a Nebraskan um, surgeon who was flying his private jet when it crashed. You can tell he's obviously American because if it was me, I'd have fallen off my tandem. But anyway, um, apparently he had to resuscitate his family. One of the family died and then they were taken to a local facility and he had to get off the trolley um, to help resuscitate his family because the quality of the care was so appalling. And that stimulated him to come up with the Advanced Trauma Life Support System. In the UK, really trauma had just evolved. The, the every unit would undertake major trauma or resuscitation of major trauma for patients in their area. And then there was a review undertaken in England which is a retrospective review of deaths from trauma to identify how those patients would have done if they'd been treated in a level one trauma centre in the USA. Now, the big outcome of that was that were, there were large numbers of patients who were dying from simple things, from hypoxia, from low oxygen, and from hypovolemia, la lack of blood, which was undertreated. And the reason mainly for this was that they didn't have a systematic approach like ATLS to guide them on how to treat. So there was such a large variation in outcomes, it was felt that things had to move forward. And at that time, they started looking at trauma and using trauma scoring to identify who was doing well, who was doing badly, and I'll cover that. In Scotland, that's the Scottish Trauma Audit Group, but in England, it's called TARN. The next thing that happened was war. And uh, with Afghanistan and our involvement, in war for the first time in ages, we started having to deal with penetrating trauma and through the experience overseas, um, new systems and ways of treating trauma and particularly hemorrhage were developed. And of course, that, as ever with every war, the lessons from that were transferred to um, civilian um, practice. And then, as I've already mentioned already, the next stage is setting up a trauma network. So we now have a system on which to base resuscitation of trauma patients on a countrywide basis, which allows us to get uh, optimise outcomes for trauma patients, particularly in rural areas of Scotland. So let's talk about scoring uh, trauma. The question always is, um, if you've got a heart attack, 
if it's bad, it's bad. The thing is, if you've got multiple trauma, how do you compare somebody who, say, has got from some fractured ribs and a broken ankle with somebody who's got a bash to the head and a ruptured spleen? Because it's difficult to say is which one is sicker. So basically, the, the criteria for you to be inserted into the Scottish Trauma Audit Group is you coming into hospital as a result of trauma and staying for more than three days or having to go to a critical care area or dying during that first three days when you've been admitted to hospital. So the way these patients, once they're admitted, we can score them using um, what you call it, statistical retrospective. So we're looking back afterwards, not before. These aren't systems where you can say this patient is ill at the start. It's going back afterwards and then saying how ill were they. And basically, it's split into two uh, things you look at. You look at the anatomical injury, how badly have they been injured? And then the second part is looking at the physiological insult. So have they bled enough that their blood pressure is low? Are they hypoxic because of their airway? So, and then you combine those two to give you a, a, a number that will allow you to say how severely that patient is injured. Let's look at anatomical injury to start with. Looking at a large number of road traffic accidents and the outcomes, the American organisation was able to assign a severity to every single possible injury you could have. Now that ranges from zero, which is nothing, one, which may be a very minor injury, up to five, which is a highly severe, uh, significant injury. Six is an injury that is um, in not in keeping with continuing life. So if you get a six, you're dead, basically. So what you do is, when you have a patient who's been injured, you note all the injuries they sustained in the different regions, and they all get assigned a different number from zero to six. Then what you do is you take each of these numbers, and the body is split into five different regions, and you take the highest number from each of the top three regions and square it. So that means if you've got a five in one area, which is the highest number, and you square it, that's 25. And if you've got that in the other two, in other two areas, that's 75. And that's the highest score. So the lowest score is zero, the highest score is 75. Um, it's not a linear scale, it jumps because it's squared. But it allows us then to define what major trauma is. So the scoring of the anatomical injury is called the injury severity score. And that's this score out of 75. That's broken down into three separate categories. Minor trauma, which is up to eight, which really equates to two squared. So that's somebody having a broken wrist, uh, what you call, or smaller injuries, multiple injuries. Nine to 15, which is three squared. So that's slightly more significant injuries, but not likely to be um, uh, particularly significant. And then once you're above 15, that's four squared and above, um, that's regarded as major trauma. And once you're above 15, your mortality is 10% and increases after that as the anatomical uh, insult increases. So that allows us to determine how badly the body has been injured. The separate si system is the physiological measurement and it's called the revised trauma score. And basically what it does is it takes your Glasgow Coma Scale your blood pressure and your respiratory rate, and you get a score out of four depending how abnormal it is. Now what they do from that, so that gives you a score out of 12, but what they do is they then weight it because Glasgow Coma Scale score is a really bad prognostic indicator if it's lower, low, obviously respiratory rate. It's not so indicator if you're in pain because that doesn't necessarily mean you're that unwell. So basically, the bottom line is you get a score out of 7.84 at the end, the end of the day. And if that's 7.84, you're normal. Anything down from that means that you're severely compromised. So they then can take these two scores, the injury severity score and the revised trauma score, and uh, use some flash mathematics and work out your probability of survival for every individual patient. And then what you can do from that is you can take the groupings of the patients that you've dealt with in a certain in a trauma ser service and can say how many of these patients who were, had a high probability of survival died. So you need to look at those cases or those cases who 
were expected to die but lived and what did we do right in those cases and that allows us to compare different segments of the trauma service to see how they're performing. So really it's a lot of mathematics but at the end of the day it means we can actually tell if we're doing well or if we're doing badly and then uh, revise our system to improve it. So using uh, injury scoring uh, in major trauma we can look at trends that have been occurring over the years in terms of looking after patients. There are newer trauma scores that are coming along as we become more sophisticated, but these are the basic ones that I want you to know about, and you can read up about the newer ones uh, uh, when you get time. But just as an example, in 1990, which is now nearly 30 years ago, the average age for somebody involved in major trauma was about 36 years. The Grouping, age grouping for the most uh, major trauma cases was from uh, 0 to 24 years. It's split into 25 year groups. Uh, the mechanism in those days was 59% were from road traffic collisions and about 72% of them were male. Flash forward to 2013 and the average age is 53.8. And in fact, the latest STAG data from last year is now 59. So the patients that we're treating with major trauma are getting older. The age group that was most common was 25 to 50 uh, years old, with the second commonest group being over 75. So we now are definitely looking after more trauma amongst elderly people or more mature people. The commonest cause for major trauma is now falls under two meters not road traffic collisions, which means that basically fall, people are falling over most of the time. Um, and basically we're CTing 80% of these patients now because we can, because we're having to, to um, try and seek out injuries. So really what we're seeing is when I was a boy, most of the major trauma we saw were young guys either fighting with each other, getting involved in road traffic accidents because they were driving or drinking, drinking too much and driving, uh, or industrial accidents, with very few of them being elderly people. Whereas now we still have a core group of people who are involved in traditional major trauma, which is high speed collisions uh, and falls. However, now it is mainly an elderly population who are falling over and significantly injuring themselves. So what I really want you to think about now is that there's almost two different populations of patients who will look after with major trauma. There's still that small group of people who will be in road, involved in road traffic collisions and other significant uh, injuries. But these people are usually normal. They don't have chronic disease. And in the past, that's how everybody seemed to think about that. It was all about young people damaging themselves by uh, being adventurous. Um, and that's what's portrayed in the TV and that's what's usually portrayed in all the helicopter pro programmes. But the reality is that a large amount of the major trauma that you will be looking after will be individuals, either old individuals who are in a road traffic collision or who have fallen over at home often. And these are a group of patients who may be difficult to identify initially because it's pretty easy to know if somebody's injured if they've just smashed a car at 20, 70 miles an hour. However, somebody's just fallen down the living room or fallen down some stairs, they may have minor injuries, but some of these patients will have major injuries. And the other thing is, they're not normal to start with. Most of them have got chronic disease, weaker bones, their physiology is differently, so they can fool you. So you have to be aware of the differences between adults and younger people. So that means the physiology might fool you because their blood pressure is maybe high before. So their blood pressure maybe being 120 over 80, which would be normal, isn't normal for them. That might be low for them. Equally, things like their respiratory rate and their conscious level may be different from uh, younger people. So you have to step back and have a higher index of suspicion when you're looking at these patients. So we are now much, have a much lower threshold for scanning these patients, particularly in terms of neck injuries or chest injuries. Rib fractures in an elderly patient increases their mortality significantly, something that wouldn't be a problem for a younger person. 
And of course, some of these patients have got significant comorbid conditions, so the mortality rate will increase. But you need to be aware of the, this when you're seeing them initially in the field and in hospitals, so you adapt the response to them appro appropriately. So hopefully I've made it clear that there is now almost two separate groups of patients that we're dealing with your major trauma with a massive increase in the elderly population who are presenting with major trauma. Now that's the bad news, but the good news is that the basic principles of looking after the trauma patient are really unchanged. So I want to go through a few basic rules that I want you to follow for each of these patients when you're dealing with suspected major trauma. So there's uh, the structure for managing major trauma is split into four phases, and that's the primary survey when you assess the patient for life-threatening injuries, resuscitation if that is required, it may not be required, but you're gonna do that often in, at the same time as the primary survey if there's an immediate life-threatening uh, condition present. You then go on to a secondary survey to examine the patient from head to toe to make sure you haven't missed any of the injuries that they've got. And then the final uh, phase is definitive treatment, i.e. they go off to get their spleen out or get their hip fixed or to get their femur pinned. Now, the important thing about this is that the shorter the time between injury and getting to definitive treatment, the more likely you are to have a positive outcome. It's not an absolute, but as a general trend, that's it. That's why in every TV show about emergency departments, people run with patients to get them into the resuscitation room and get them into the hospital. Now, that's one thing that I absolutely want to, you to remember. You should always have the background feeling when you're dealing with a patient with trauma, I need to get this patient to definitive care. You may get distracted by some things, but in the background, should you always be thinking, I need to be on the road and getting them to an appropriate facility. And that doesn't change, and that hasn't changed. So I want you to use that all the time. You should always be thinking in the back of your mind, why am I standing here and not on the way to hospital? Now, patients come in all forms and sizes at the end of the day. And the thing is that, you know, I always think of it as there's only three types of pathology in Scotland. You're either wheel, knee wheel, or you're half a knee wheel. Now, if you're off a knee wheel, it's pretty obvious you need to go to hospital. If you're off a wheel, usually we can have got time to think, do I need to take them? But the big group that are difficult are that middle group who may not be wheel, <laughs> but are they off a knee wheel? Now, their numbers can fool you, as I've said already. So the physiology, the vast majority of patients in the STAG data will present with normal physiology. So in those patients, you then, and this is the next important point I want you to think about, is that always think about the mechanism of injury and look at the scene that you're presented with because if the patient's not immediately telling you they're unwell by their altered blood pressure or whatever, or their altered conscious level, you've got to start thinking, right, they're stable, but do I have to have a high level of suspicion because of what I'm seeing. So a car that's had the front axle deformed significantly, even if the patient's well, they could have an underlying injury. The old woman who's fallen down the stairs who appears all right with her numbers, but you're looking at her and you're thinking that was five steps. She's got underlying uh, osteoporosis. She could have something going on here. So the next thing is, I, the first thing is, I need to be moving the patient if they're unwell. The second thing is if they're stable, think about mechanism and try and work out what's happened and is that likely to be resulting in something that needs hospital treatment and specifically major intervention for major trauma. Okay, so now we've covered most of the background, let's go on to actually treating the patient. So I already mentioned the primary survey. Primary survey is a rapid assessment of the patient to identify if they have any life-threatening injury that requires acute intervention. And it's usually thought of as A, B, C, D, E, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, environment. But since Afghanistan happened, where we put the C before that, which is catastrophic hemorrhage, that you may have to intervene with that. 
Now, as I've already said, the majority of patients you will be presented with, you will go through the A, B, C, D, E quickly, they'll be all right. So the simplest way you can do that is say, are you all right? If they say, yes, I'm all right, I've just fallen down the stairs and my leg's sore, their airway's clear, they're breathing enough to speak to you, they may still have an injury, but you don't need to do anything then. They've got enough blood pressure to perfuse their brain and they're answering your question. You've completed your primary survey and you should be thinking, do I need to take this patient to hospital? Uh, because you're not really gonna have to intervene acutely but you're going to take your time to do a secondary survey to see if they've got any injuries and consider the mechanism so that you, they can then do a bit of a small risk analysis as to what you're going to do with this patient. Now, in the worst circumstances, you may have a patient in traumatic cardiac arrest. I'm not going to cover this because uh, Mike Donald, my colleague and friend, has covered this in a separate uh, uh, session. So I'm leaving that, he's covered that completely. I'm going to deal with the patients who are not in cardiac arrest. So, as I've said already, it's C, A, B, C, D, E is the primary survey. So, and that's come about because we're concerned about ca catastrophic hemorrhage. So the next take, take home message I want you to have is, it is vitally important to keep the patient's own blood in their body. And by that, what I mean is the blood, you, you can't compensate by giving people blood. And so um, stored blood, if you give it to the patient, only has half the oxygen carrying capacity of their own blood. So that's why we prefer to keep their own blood in them than try and give them more blood. So just keep thinking, I need to make sure this patient has as much of their blood still circulating as possible. So the situations you might be presented with that is somebody who may have a cut or something that's bleeding. Something that's bleeding, obviously, and for that you would apply direct pressure and you'll be taught techniques as how to apply that. If you can't control that hemorrhage by direct pressure, particularly if it's on a limb, you would want to apply a combat tourniquet to stop the hemorrhage at that stage. But both of those measures are aimed at keeping the patient's blood from spilling out onto the ground and keeping it in their circulation. Then alternatives are then for bleeding that's internal to the patient. Now that may be in the internal torso or it may be into the soft tissues of a limb. So examples for that are the application of a pelvic binder to try and reduce bleeding from a pelvic fracture. If you have any suspicion of features of a, a pelvic injury from the mechanism of injury, or if there's signs of bruising in the perineum or swelling in the, uh, uh, the uh, what you call it, in the testicular sac for male patients, you, you're gonna apply a pelvic splint. For limbs that have been broken or out of position, you want to splint those. If you splint them before transfer, you reduce hemorrhage by about half. And I just want to mention now about tranexamic acid, which is a drug that's been around for years. Um, it was used for heavy periods for, by women for years and years in tablet form. And then, as often in medicine, nobody thought it actually might work somewhere else where you're bleeding. And then suddenly I had the idea that, yes, this might work there. And of course, we can give it intravenously. Obviously, you wouldn't be doing that in the initial primary survey until you got intravenous access, so I'll cover that when we cover um, uh, circulatory measures. So we've covered uh, catastrophic hemorrhage or, hemorrhage or potentially uh, catastrophic hemorrhage. It's rare to encounter this in civilian practice, but it's important that that is the first measure that you undertake. So we'll move on to airway now. Now, you will all get extensive training in management of the airway uh, as paramedics. So in trauma, the 2016 NICE guidance on managing trauma says that if the patient is found to have a compromised airway, if you have the skills, you should try and do a rapid uh, sequence intubation to secure them. So these are the group of aphony wheel patients in whom we need to take over their breathing. If you don't have those skills and can't get someone to them uh, immediately, the next stage down is to consider putting a laryngeal mask airway down. And as my role is in the chair of basics and training on basics, that's what we train uh, nurses and GPs to do as their main airway um, uh, intervention. 
If you don't have that, you're going to use simple adjuncts like oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal airway and bag valve mask to maintain their airway. And the thing is, remember, every patient needs oxygen. Now, I'm very much aware that now there's a, a vogue for um, titrating the oxygen to response, but in the initial stages, you should just apply high flow oxygen until you've made an assessment and decided um, how sick the patient is and if you require rapid intervention for the airway. Then, if they're stable, titrate the uh, oxygen to the readings from the pulse oximeter. Um, so that's all I'm going to say at the moment about airway because I know you covered, uh, you're taught this in other areas of your of your course, but that is the current um, uh, algorithm that is recommended by NICE. Now, airway and breathing uh, assessment and uh, intervention are linked. However, in our experience in basics and in other educational activities, breathing assessment is often the um, segment of assessment which is done most poorly. And one of the things that is uh, often omitted by doctors is to measure the respiratory rate. Respiratory rate is one of the most sensitive markers of someone who is, appears well but may be unwell. You always have to uh, give consideration to the fact that they may be stressed or in pain, but if the patient is uh, is being given analgesia or is not obviously in pain, if their respiratory rate is raised, you must assume they have some sort of injury which is either directly to the chest or they are hypovolemic until proven otherwise. So always ensure that you do a detailed respiratory assessment. In the first instant, if it's uh, initial contact, it's as simple as counting the number of breaths they take over six seconds. If it's less than two, they're not breathing uh, uh, fast enough and they'll probably be unconscious anyway. If it's more than five in 10 seconds, they would become a P1, priority one, in any triage situation. You can do that initially and then get a number. So if it's eight, give some treatment, give some oxygen, and then go back and check it again. Once you've got control of the situation, take the opportunity to measure it over 30 seconds and double it so you get a more uh, accurate number so you can trend it. Also, of course, if you've got your pulse oximeter and they're not too cold, get that on because that will give you a good uh, assessment of what their oxygenation actually is right. But remember, if they're very, very cold and shut down peripherally, the SAO2 may not be accurate. And finally, in this area, the main problems that we're looking for in the chest is attention pneumothorax. So examine the chest for expansion, for uh, by auscultation to see if there's signs of a collapsed lung. If you suspect attention, you're not going to immediately intervene unless the patient is deteriorating. If they are going off and their saturations are dropping and losing consciousness, that's when you're going to have to make a hole in the chest. Most important thing is that we do not stick a needle in the chest anymore. It's a small uh, hole, it might give you some uh, decompression, but it's not a big hole and they often kink. So now the guidance is that you should perform a surgical thoracotomy to make a small hole in the chest. If you don't get air out of that one, make the same hole on the other side because often it's difficult in the pre hospital situation to determine which side the injury is on. So this assumes that you have those skills. If you don't have those skills, you'll need to contact someone who does have them. Let's discuss circulation now. We've already talked about catastrophic hemorrhage, so you should have uh, stopped that early in the uh, assessment if they're bleeding externally. Often, you won't be putting on the pelvic binder if you suspect there's a, a, an injury until you've done your E and B. But now at this stage, you're going to be thinking about that. Uh, how do I keep the blood in their circulation? So that's going to be, let's apply pelvic binder and uh, straighten out the limbs. If the patient is off a knee wheel and has a low blood pressure, you're going to assess that by what you call checking for a carotid pulse. If it's absent, you've got to start your traumatic cardiac arrest measures that we mentioned earlier. However, if they've lost their radial pulse, which will be a, um, a sort of crude measure that their blood pressure is below 90, 
you are probably going to want to try and give them some fluid before they come into hospital. Now this is where we use a thing called permissive hypotension. We're not going to, in the, in, in, from a history point of view, in Vietnam they used to flood the patients in the battlefield with two litres of fluid. And this was thought to be good for them because it would replace any blood they'd lost. But the problem was it would push their blood pressure up. And the problem is if you push the blood pressure up and there's a big hole in one of the vessels, it bleeds more. And as I've said already, we're trying to keep their blood in their circulation. If you push the pressure up too much, they're bleeding their own blood, which has got oxygen carrying capacity, but you're replacing it effectively with water. So their clotting will go off because they get diluted, plus their oxygenation will go off, and therefore they become acidotic, and basically you're killing them. So that's why we do not give fluids and large quantities, but what we do do is if there is the radial pulse is absent, or you've managed to do a blood pressure and it's low, uh, below 90, you can give them small aliquots of fluid limited to 250 mils, usually of saline, but you may be, uh, it depends what you carry if you've got Hartman's. So you give a small dose and then check to see what the, if their pulse has come back. If they have a radial pulse, you stop the fluid, keep it in place because you may have to give another bolus, and then get them transferred to hospital. So now we need to talk about how you get the fluid into them. So again, nice guidance is if you can get an intravenous act, a line into them, fine. If you can, get two lines, just in case one can be used for drugs and as a backup for the one that you're giving fluids in. If they are severely shocked or you're having difficulty putting an IV uh, line in, your next line should be an intraosseous needle. And the intraosseous needle will usually be inserted either in the top of the humerus or into tibia if there isn't any evidence of a femoral fracture or pelvic fracture in that area. These you will be taught separately, but that's it. It's IV first, then IO, and then there are more advanced techniques of getting central access, but usually that requires expertise of doctors to be undertaking these uh, manoeuvres that are not used routinely in most cases in the pre-hospital environment. And as promised, I wanted to speak a little about tranexamic acid. Um, this was introduced as a measure um, really earlier on in this uh, decade uh, significantly. Um, however, studies are now um, being reported in some of them within the last couple of months showing that from extensive usage that there is definite improvement in patients who are experiencing bleeding by having trianexamic acid delivered to them. So therefore, if you have evidence of them bleeding or a suspicion of them bleeding and it is within three hours of their trauma, you should be giving them intravenous tranexamic acid and it may be followed up by uh, uh, infusion. However, that may not be starting in the pre-hospital environment, but you should give them a bolus prior to transfer to hospital. The evidence is now very strong for this being um, effective. Okay, so we've gone through C, A, B, C. Now we're on to D for disability. When you're assessing the patient, obviously when you've spoken to them to start with and if they're speaking to you normally, they've got a normal Glasgow Coma Scale. If they ha aren't speaking to you at this point, you can use AVPU, i.e. which stands for alert, or the patient is responding to voice, or the patient is responding to pain or is unconscious. So you should do this in the first instance to give you a baseline. So if they aren't speaking to you immediately, call their name or ask, just say, hello patient, are you? Or can you respond to me? If they don't respond to that, you give them pain. And that usually should be administered about the level of the cl clavicle, and usually it'll be uh, pressure on the supraorbital nerve or tweaking of the, the ear lobe to see if they respond to that. So I've pushed should be used first. Glasgow Coma Scale will be used later, but that's once you've got control of the situation, in which case you use the chart to go through a formal assessment of the Glasgow Coma Scale. Now I like to include uh, drugs under um, uh, disability, and what we're really talking is about analgesia for patients 
uh, who are in pain because major trauma patients who are alert and awake will normally be in a large amount of pain. Drugs should be given intravenously and titrated to response and morphine is still the recommended first line drug by NICE although ketamine is increasingly being used and has some benefits in certain uh, patients but morphine is still first line and you should be given this as a single dose of a milligram diluted down uh, usually in a milligram per, uh, per mil. You give the initial milligram, wait a few minutes to make sure they're not uh, opiate naive and uh, stop breathing on you and then you can increase the morphine by one milligram per minute until they're comfortable. If you haven't got intravenous access you can use intranasal diamorphine or intranasal ketamine. Intranasal diamorphine is used quite commonly in children because it's difficult to get intravenous access but can work effectively um, uh, intranasal diamorphine in adults as well if made up in the right concentration. And finally in this section if you've read some of the guidelines the, there is some controversy over what you do in terms of fluid resuscitation with patients with a head injury. Now the reason behind this is that the small aliquots that I was describing you're giving to someone who might be hypovolemic because we don't want to bleed out if the patient predominantly has a head injury and no other injuries, we actually want to keep their blood pressure higher so that the perfusion of their brain is, is, is maintained. This is a difficult one to make a decision about pre-hospital. As a general rule, you would have to be absolutely sure that it was, there was no other cause for their hypotension other than the head injury in which case you may be able to give larger amounts of fluid. However in this situation I think the best thing would be for you to contact control or contract um, the um, duty consultant in the local trauma centre to ask uh, for guidance as to how much fluid should be given. So now we're on to exposure. This is difficult in the pre-hospital environment you want to try and do an external assessment. You don't want to strip them off, and particularly in Scotland, um, you don't want to keep, let them get cold. So um, it really, it's doing your secondary survey as best you can for injuries. But again, the guiding principle is if they're stable, you're going to get, and you feel the need to go to hospital, get moving towards hospital at that stage. Uh, it's usually worth, particularly if you think it's been an assault, to check the back of the patient by either putting your hands behind the back to see if there's any bleeding there which might guide you to roll the patient to have a look to see if there's something going on. But in general, do the minimum you need to ensure that they are stable and that you're not missing anything, particularly if you've got a long journey. So that brings us on to transport. So once again, and I'll keep saying it, Keep thinking, I've got to get to hospital. If you think the patient isn't, isn't going to be discharged, they are coming to hospital. Now, obviously, the exception to that will be if the patient's entrapped. And if you've made the assessment, if the, cha if the patient is unwell or unstable, or is stable and you think from your assessment of the mechanism and the scenario that they could potentially have an injury for which they're compensating at that time, you would need to seek help. Um, where you call it, well, if there is going to be a prolonged extrication. So sources of help can be basics doctors if they are locally and uh, available and control should be able to identify that for you or you may need to ask for more intensive support like helicopter support or even a mobile team coming from the local trauma centre to assist you. But if you're not going to be moving quickly ask for help or seek support at the scene at that time. Similarly, in terms of multiple casualties on scene, there may be transport issues in evacuating them all at the same time and some patients may have to wait or you may have a choice of having to transfer them in vehicles that do not have paramedics on board. In this situation, you should seek support from the trauma desk or from senior members of staff to make these decisions and I'll talk a little bit more about how we might be able to deal with these uh, in the future.
we've decided we're going to transport the patient and now the big question nowadays with the new trauma network is where are you going to take the patients to? It was kind of easy in the past because you took them to the next nearest available hospital with an ED but if that ED isn't set up to deal with major trauma or with head injury or that, you may be doing the patient a dis, uh, uh, disservice by transferring them there. So that's why we now have the trauma network, in which case that you would try and make following set criteria where you're going to take this patient to. Obviously, the more obviously uh, injured uh, patients with major trauma would be hope, you would be hopeful of transferring them directly to a trauma centre. But this is by no means um, clear cut. The criteria are there to help you, but you will always have to make a tailored decision for the situation that you're involved. Even if it's just for the individual, if it's one patient, but if there's multiple casualties, how are you going to manage them on site? So whilst there are criteria that you will follow, always consider asking for senior support, either from the trauma desk or if they can't make a decision, now there should be a trauma consultant on for each of the major trauma centres that you can contact directly to help support you with the decision as to where you're going to take this patient. And really you should be trying to make this decision before you set off. And then once you've set off, alert the, um, the unit that you're transferring to, to give them um, information. Uh, I, everybody calls this a pre-alert. I just really always have a problem with that uh, term because a pre-alert is when you phone and say, hello, I'm just about to alert you. But we call it that because it sounds sexy. But basically, it's just alert where you're going, that you're coming and what you're dealing with so they can prepare uh, a trauma response for your arrival. So we've covered most of the core components to managing major trauma. Um, most of this is about systems and processes for managing these patients, which will vary from time to time. But what I want to do now is just recap the key messages that I want you to be carrying with you when faced with potential major trauma or actual major trauma. And they're pretty straightforward. Number one, Minimise time to the definitive care. Or if you want to think of it another way, keep moving, just keep moving. The second one is think about the mechanism of injury when you're there, especially if the patient's physiology is normal. Are you missing something? Are you, have you got somebody from a road traffic accident who's actually ruptured the aorta, but their blood pressure is normal, but when you look at the deformity of the car, you think, how did he survive that? Well, he probably didn't survive it without some injury that we're going to have to look after. So if in doubt, call and transfer. Third one is keep the patient's body, blood, sorry, keep the patient's blood in their body. Four is ensure effective oxygenation. Five is fluids, only if indicated and in small amounts to maintain the radial pulse. Six is analgesia for the patient who is conscious and seven is transport the patient to definitive care if that is possible. So what about the future? Well this is some of the stuff that I'm interested in my other roles that I mentioned at the start. Car design, there's no doubt car design and road design has been responsible for the reduction in road traffic collisions that we're seeing um, and this is only going to get better. I mean, some car manufacturers have got internal cameras now. They, well, they've got internal mechanics, but if the car's involved in a, an accident, it will call uh, help. That's almost old hat. But some cars are now being designed with internal cameras that will actually detect any deformity. Uh, and if you're wearing, um, uh, what you call it, Fitbit technology in your clothing, which is now possible, they will detect any physiological damage for you. So it might be kind of sexy in the future for people not just to wear driving gloves and that, but you'll wear your driving suit that actually will alert help and actually diagnose you and before the, the health services arrive. Obviously prevention in terms of um, assault and um, penetrating trauma is really down to healthcare measures to reduce violence and alcohol. But the big area that I'm involved in in my um, telehealth um, activities is prevention of falls. And in fact, there is technology now coming out with, again, home sensors 
and wearable technology which can identify falls in patients up to two to three weeks before they happen because it detects alterations in their gait and their movements that then can alert somebody to give them some physiotherapy or something to, to um, reduce the risk at home or a home assessment. So these things are all potential in the future because prevention is better than cure at the end of the day. How about technology for actually treating patients? Well, one of the things we're not doing particularly well at the moment, even with all the systems we have, is the communication between the incident site and uh, the healthcare services. Uh, in the 1990s, I remember it was suggested that people should take Polaroid cameras to the um, scene of the accident so that when you arrived at the hospital, we would be able to see how bad the accident was or how much damage there was to the car. It's kind of ridiculous that at this stage we can't, we're not routinely sending images from the site of the hospital, uh, from the site of the injury to the hospital. So really what we should be looking at now is having cameras on scene immediately that will transmit data back to either ambulance control and to the receiving hospital so that we can directly intervene with clinical decision support for the individual patients, but also for what the de destinations of the, some of these patients are. And in a multiple casualty situation, we may actually manage some of the patients who do not need immediate uh, transfer at the scene until we can release transport, which will be able to take them directly to the trauma centre rather than taking them to a local locality. So you could identify a local basics doctor to come to the scene who could be supported by a specialist until such time as either a helicopter arrives or where you've got further transport can arrive. So we can make these sort of judgments which will allow us to organise and triage the patients more effectively. The other big thing is we're going to start using drones. I know they've shut down half the airports, but this is the way, bef uh, uh, is the way ahead. They're using them routinely in, in um, mountain rescue. And the advantage of the drone is it can be on the scene faster. It can send images. You could potentially be able to send uh, blood samples from the scene to hospital for cross-match of blood if there's an entrapment situation or it's going to take some time to get into hospital. And also, in some areas, they're flying out equipment, more complex equipment, using drones to the site of the incident. And in terms of management on the scene, we will be able to take more um, technology to the patient to treat them there. So examples of that would be ultrasound. Ultrasound's been used by paramedics, but the thing is if you can transmit those images and allow somebody to interpret them in the hospital, they'll allow you to make better decisions. And who knows, they're already talking about taking CTs in the back of ambulances for strokes, so we might even be doing that in the future, but I think that's a long way off. So that's it, basically. We've spoken about the basics and the core elements of managing or measuring and managing uh, major trauma. We've talked about how major trauma has changed, how we've been very successful using our preventative measures and things like safe drive, stay alive and altering people's behaviour. But we've still got almost about the same number of patients presenting with major trauma. It's just the demographics changed and it is now much more elderly patients that we're looking after and they are a subgroup in whom management in the hospital is completely different and may affect pre-hospital assessment. I'm coming up to retirement now and uh, but I'm finding it quite exciting that we now finally have a trauma network in Scotland and we're now getting a second helicopter for retrieval. So we are edging towards being cutting edge uh, trauma uh, specialists in Scotland and have the potential probably to, to deliver world-class uh, care to major trauma patients, even those in remote and, uh, and uh, rural environments. So I hope this has been helpful and uh, hopefully I'll be seeing you on a screen from the site of the accident in the near future. I'd like to thank you Professor Ferguson for a really interesting talk on the management of trauma um, that we've just listened to. Um, if you're okay, there's been a number mm. of questions that have been submitted. Um, yep. Are you okay to go? Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you feel that we can reduce the human factors? Okay, yeah. I mean, I think at the moment in my experience, 
and, and you know, the whole of this talk is really my viewpoint, being an old man, uh, but with lots of experience. Um, I think that what we're finding is, you know, a lot of the sort of process and, you know, the A, B, C, D, E and all this, it, it's all been rehearsed and there's, there's little bits of this that we're tweaking. But the biggest thing, in, and a lot of this is what the trauma network's about, is how we integrate the different services because the, the problem with major trauma is it involves lots of different people being involved in it. Sure. And our experience to date has been that really we, we need to work on this sort of communications between the hospital and the ambulance service and the other services that are using that. And, and to a certain extent that's, you know, because every crash is almost, or, or major trauma case is different and it's in different areas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're in the middle of a city, in some ways it can be easier, but it might be different, more difficult if you're really remote and you've got a choice of places that you might send the patient to and you've got limited resource to respond, you've really got to, there's not one protocol fits all. Of course. Mm -hmm. And we've had several accidents, particularly when it's multiple casualties that, you know, not necessarily a major incident, but just enough to have, you know, a, a car load of people injured. Um, having to decide how we're going to use the resources and where to send the p patients. And I think that's key at the moment because you, we can use technology to use this. But actually, we could use the phone if we used it better. So if we could speak to each other and we could get better information, it could just be images as well. Mm -hmm. But we just seem to be, you know, we've got the trauma desk as part of this. We've now got on-call consultants for what will be four trauma centres. So you should be able to get direct good clinical decision support from a senior clinician quickly. So I think we need to work a bit more about how we do that and how we make decisions. So I mean examples would be is if say you are in rural Scotland and you're not right next to or between the hospitals, it may be that they'll be responding with a paramedic response, it may be that they're responding with a technician only who may not have advanced skills, you may have a basic doctor available, you may have a first responder. So what we've got to be able to do is how do we maximise the use of that resource knowing it's going to vary considerably. So obviously an advanced practitioner, if the helicopter can get there with a intensivist, mm -hmm. that means you've got all that expertise there. But would, how do you vary it so we can get the best quality of care to every single accident? And that may be that it's a, a technician being supervised by a paramedic remotely, okay. or might be asking for a senior doctor to help them support that. So we need to work around that and how we can use better communications and communications technology to, in that initial phase to, to make the best decisions. In your opinion, what do you feel would be the one major factor that would make a difference? Right, at the moment, I think we're, we're actually, I think the communications thing is the most important thing at the moment. But we're really at the moment at the start of this next phase of a sort of countrywide response. So it's going to be interesting how it, how it develops because introducing the trauma centres, we've, we've already had, you know, um, units that deal with a lot of trauma. You know, my own units, there's a lot of road tra trauma because we've got bad roads around us. Um, but now it's how we're going to coordinate all of that. So we're going to have four centres, which may be too many, may not be enough, but at the moment what we've got to see is how are they going to work differently now and how are we going to coordinate that. And again, as I said in the talk, what we'll be doing is auditing this to see if there's improved outcomes or so we know what's happening. But it's not just about the, the outcomes for the patients. It has to be how slick was the process of being able to respond to the patients, get the patients to the right place at the right time, which is a bit of a cliche now, but that's really what we're trying to do. And overcoming the problems of distance and variable amounts of uh, resource in various areas, mm -hmm. that's the key thing that we're going to have to work on. It's kind of exciting time just now because, you know, traditionally it's just been getting them the back of the ambulance, get them somewhere. And then we added, oh, we might actually be able to take some doctor stay in the back of a helicopter or something like that or in a response unit. And I think the next challenge is, well, you know what, how do we make that uniform all the time or a un as close to a uniform standard as we can? So yeah, 
better comms, and you know we're going to see how things go over the next the next few years. But you know we're in a really good place to come out as a really as a nation one of the best in the world. What would you say would be the major advances um, in, in technology that perhaps can be, be used uh, okay. in, in the future? Good. I mean, the answer to that is in two parts, because okay. there's, the, there's, the, there's the first thing about how do we treat the patients. So the big step forward we had was you know, using tranexamic acid, which is an old drug that we used somewhere else, which is typical of the health service. You know, we discover something in one area and then we don't figure out for years how to use it somewhere else. So the, 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 the major advances in that are going to really be, well, you know, I don't know, because it's, it's going to be things like, actually, there'll be things like how are we going to manage patients who are in these anticoagulant drugs? Because mm -hmm. the problem is we've now got these elderly patients. Um, they're living longer because we're making their blood thinner, uh, but they fall over, <laughs> so they bleed more. So we've got that sort of dichotomy. And the thing is, at the moment, the drugs we're using only one of them, well, one of them has an absolute reversal agent. Another one has a partial reversal agent, and the other ones really don't have anything. Mm -hmm. You just have to try and make them clot more. And we really need to address that at the moment. It's one of these unintended consequences of good treatment and preventing stroke and everything it means that from our point of view, from trauma, actually we've got a big problem because these right. people will bleed more. And we don't have a coordinated response for that. Um, so it, it, that, I think, is you know, in terms of absolute treatment for elderly patients, one of, the, one of the main things, plus how you manage those patients in the hospital, because it's going to be much more about rehabilitation, because you know, they don't just get better and go home. They, they're going to need an awful lot of support, so it'll be hard work. The other bit is really how do we use um, technology-enabled care to improve it? There's a, always a reluctance. We tend to gr do what we do more. But you know there, there is now communication technology that will allow us to have more presence at the site of the accident, make better decisions nearer to the patient. So, whilst in the middle of my talk I was kept emphasising the fact, you know, you should just keep thinking, I need to get to the hospital, I need to get to the hospital. Well, actually, having said that, in some cases where they might not be able to move them immediately, actually we might be able to take more care to the patient that will allow us to do a bit more stabilisation or more treatment. Mm -hmm. And actually the flip side of that is we'll actually might be able to do some tests there or assessments there will allow us not to even transfer the patients who are clearly okay. Mm -hmm. So it, there's lots of technology out there. Uh, and, um, you know, prevention's the, the first thing. So for elderly patients, that's how we'll do it. Because that's where they're falling over. falling over and coming to the hospital either because they get ill or they actually fall over. Mm -hmm. um, so we can use technology for that. And that's a big challenge just generally quite apart from the major trauma. But then there's all this technology about can we take more and more tests from the hospital to the patient, like ultrasound, like, like near patient testing, so we can get initial blood tests. We might even get to the stage where we can even check their clotting on site. I, I, you know, we might even be taking blood in the back of ambulances eventually, okay. but we'll see how that goes. But you know, at the moment, there's just an explosion of technology-enabled care. It's just how we apply it. Can you tell me what adaptations are being made for the elderly? I'm really glad you asked me that because one of the things I didn't cover in my talk, because it's a bit niche, but it's not niche, is um, is management of neck injuries because you know it's you know the area is airway with cervical spine control. Now we used to put collars on everybody <laughs> and to immobilise the neck, which is fine in young people, and the thing was. Um, when in the early part of the, the talk when we did some studies, you know, the incidence of actually significant neck injuries was around about 2-3% because these were fit young pe people. Okay. Um, and the thing is you could put a collar on to them. And, uh, but actually for elderly people it's a lot more difficult because they don't all have normal necks. They've got no. bent necks. And there's been good reports that if you try and force them into a collar, you actually can move their neck inappropriately because they don't fit them. So we've got to think differently now for these patients. So you have to be much more innovative. So it was kind of easy if you just said, I'll strap my collar and put the, the, the um, blocks on and take them in. I think um, ambulance service staff are going to have to be much more creative in the way that they immobilise necks. Now we are very much aware of this in the hospital mm -hmm. because 
we do know that if it's a long journey for them as well, or if they're in the hospital, sometimes they lie for a long period of time. We, we have to up our game to get these people in and the next scan. Because I've seen loads of patients who've come in who are, get unwell because they're lying there immobilised. Yeah. And actually, what we need to do is get them out of their neck immobilisation as soon as we can clear their neck. For younger people, you can do simple things. They haven't been knocked out or anything. They're low risk. For elderly people, it's difficult. So we have to set up before they come. We need to decide that we'll have a lower threshold for scanning them, but we need to get them through and get them out of that because just the actual treatment, if they're lying for ages, may actually worsen their outcomes if we're not streamlining them. Not for almost life-threatening stuff, but yeah. just to an elderly patient, they're different. We need to get them through in a way that allows us to care for them and their, their elderly status, which is a, a sort of crap <laughs> thing to say, but you know, they are different and therefore we should be, it's not about they are severely, severely ill, it's just even if they've got moderate um, trauma, if we put them through the standard process, we might be doing them a disservice. Right. And that's tailoring, that's tailoring the care of the patient. Professor Ferguson, thank you so much for You're very welcome. Um, your time and your fantastic presentation. Thank you. And that will be us concluded for today.